so I really ch like this picture. You probably have seen a lot. And the reason why I chose this is because, um, so this was taken with the Apollo mission, you know, four years ago. And for the first time, uh, humans were able to look back at the Earth and look that it was basically a very tiny blue sphere in the darkness, that there was nothing around. And, you know, that kind of puts perspective on, on life and, you know, humanity and the role around humanity, like what is it doing here and, and so on. But also to me, uh, and maybe for some of you, uh, it's uh, helped me on this question. Is anybody else out there? You know, there is a lot of empty space out there. Is there more intelligent beings? Um, I guess I can choose this. All right. And, you know, this question has been around for a while. Uh, we can see it in many uh, magazines like this. Uh, you know, every few years you, you see this. Uh, I guess there is a disclaimer on this talk. <laughs> uh, if you were thinking that I will be talking about a tourist alien in Amsterdam or some angry monster trying to eat us, uh, sorry, but uh, I will not be talking about that. Uh, maybe next time. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about SETI. And SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's a field of science. And kind of the main question that we want to answer is this, although it's not completely here, but uh, how common is intelligent life in the galaxy? You know, like, is there any other intelligent beings out there? Uh, this question um, has been asked many times. Uh, I think one of the first times, uh, in current times, I guess, uh, was by Frank Drake uh, back in the 60s. And you probably have heard about the Drake equation, which is right here. I'm going to probably use this screen over here. It's, it's, uh, you can see it probably better. Uh, so instead of thinking of an equation, it's more of a guideline to help you think about this question. And it has a lot of parameters in there. But basically what it's trying to say is like, okay, think about all the stars in the galaxy, which are billions of stars. Okay, how many of those stars have planets? All right. And how many, what are the fraction of those planets that uh, could actually support life? Uh, and how many of those actually have life? And how many of those actually could develop intelligent life that uh, is able to create technology and arcade games and other cool stuff. Um, so recently, we have been able to answer some of these uh, questions. And actually, just a few years ago, uh, the Kepler mission is a spacecraft, a telescope that was pointing a piece of the sky. You probably hopefully can see this video. Uh, that piece of the sky, it was looking at thousands of stars for a long time, a few years. It was looking to planets like this, which are in what is called a habitable zone. So it means that planets are not too close, that are too hot, or not too far away, that are too cold. But it's just right in the middle, where you can have liquid water. It was also looking for planets just the size of the Earth. And the main discovery that this uh, spacecraft uh, was able to do was that uh, we now know that out of, uh, in basically the whole galaxy, one in five stars has a planet just like the Earth orbiting at the right distance. So that's, that's huge news because that means that there are a lot of planets, you know, millions of them in our galaxy, that in principle will have some kind of life. Um, woo! Uh, all right, so, but we have, have we find any life yet? Well, no. Uh, <laughs> hopefully soon. Uh, all right. So what can I tell you about, uh, ca can we guess if there is going to be life out there? Uh, from other parts of science, what is called astrobiology, we're trying to answer this question. So we know that there is ex uh, complex chemistry in other stars. We have detected that with telescopes. Uh, also, biologists have found what are called uh, extremophiles, these are very particular bacteria that live in the most extreme environments. Uh, they can live in the very deep oceans or also on the water pools of uh, nuclear plants, which is crazy. 
Um, so that kind of tells us that life can be basically, uh, you know, in very extreme places. So it's very easy to have life in a way, at least the bacteria kind. Uh, we also know that uh, the universe is very old place. Uh, so old that it is, will be very easy for any kind of bacteria living out, out there to evolve to have some kind of uh, smart beings, complex uh, organisms like, like we are. So all this is a guess. Uh, the fact is that we don't know. There's no constraints. There's no constraints about this. Uh, so it is actually equally likely that we are the only civilization in the galaxy, or there are thousands of them. We just don't know. Uh, so probably you know who Carl Sagan is. He was a very famous astronomer in the 90s and 80s. Uh, so he said back then that the only significant test uh, about this to search for uh, intelligent life is an experimental one. So we need to make an experiment to try to find this answer. Uh, so we cannot really look for dolphins or very smart chimpanzees. So the thing that you can do uh, is uh, try to look for technology and use technology as a proxy for intelligence. So these are examples of what kind of technology we can find. These are, of, of course, our own technology. Uh, these are uh, different kinds of electromagnetic emission. So we have radio here, and we have also lasers or uh, visible or optical light. So all of this is electromagnetic radiation. And these are actually are very powerful. Uh, just kind of to give you an example, so for TV and radio here on Earth, the transmitters that we have, so, you know, like a, a light bulb uh, has like, you know, 100 watts or something. So uh, these ones can be up to like half a million watts. Uh, if you have an aircraft radar, that's like thousands of times stronger. And the strongest thing that we have now with our current technologies is called a interplanetary radar. And that's even a thousand times, even stronger than that. So uh, this kind of... Uh, transmitters or radars are actually very strong. So this is a very large dish. It's actually about 300 yards uh, length. It's in Arecibo, which is in Puerto Rico, uh, around a lot of mountains. And uh, it is used by astronomers to uh, make basically radar uh, images of asteroids or nearby asteroids. So it's super powerful. And it's so powerful that you can actually detect it across the galaxy. So even our own technology, if there is some aliens out there, they could actually hear or like listen to what we are uh, already broadcasting. It, it, it takes a long time. Uh, the, the speed of light is finite. Uh, so to cross the whole galaxy, it will take thousands of years. So this is just a picture of the galaxy. And hopefully this video plays better. All right. So here's the galaxy, it's rotating. So one of the stars here is, is the sun. You know, you have millions of stars here uh, orbiting all around the center. Uh, so if you have, imagine, a radio emission from some uh, civilization, you will start to create these kind of bubbles, you know, bubbles of radio emission. Uh, so this is something that we can try to detect. So kind of to summarize what I've been saying so far, imagine that you have a planet where you have life, and then intelligent life appears, which creates technology, which actually creates radio signals that is trying to, you know, put out out there. So it might happen that at some point that civilization just gets extinct. Uh, so while that create, we make these kind of empty bubbles. We have some kind of, uh, you know, holes in, in the middle. Uh, and at some point, they will arrive here on Earth, and that's kind of the emission or the kind of the, the signals that you can detect at some point. So uh, if you back. If we look back at these kind of uh, spheres here, uh, the, the thickness of, of these uh, spheres kind of tell you the length of time that civilization has been around. And I think during these times, uh, that's, that's uh, something to think about. You know, uh, we can get extinct at any time. You know, there are many reasons. Uh, you have uh, nuclear bombs. Uh, you have you know, the worst presidents out there. <laughs> there are many reasons uh, why we can get extinct. Uh, hopefully not. Um, yeah, I kind of lost my 
train of thought there. <laughs> Next slide. All right. So, uh, so in SETI, what we're trying to do um, uh, is look for these kinds of signals. Uh, if you are here on the ground of the Earth, uh, the atmosphere play, plays a big role on what kind of signals you can find. So here, what I'm showing is a uh, wavelength. Uh, so different wavelengths of light uh, appear in different forms. So uh, at this uh, size of a wavelength of, of, of light is the visible light that you can see. Uh, then you have infrared, and then it goes larger wavelengths, and you get to radio. Shorter than visible light, you have like UV, for instance. And so what is, this plot is trying to show is that the atmosphere is opaque to, to many frequencies or many wavelengths. Uh, and that's good because that then we don't have UV light, for instance, hitting us all the time. Uh, so we can have, you know, a nice time at the beach and so on. Um, so, uh, but that's, that's kind of the, the regions, these kind of windows over here that we can use to detect uh, emission. So uh, in the visible light, we have lasers, and that we're looking for lasers. And in the radio, we're looking for radars and other kinds of uh, radio emission. All right, so uh, for the rest of the talk, I will, I'm gonna tell you about the Breakthrough Listen project, which I'm part of. Um, this is Yuri Milner. Uh, he lives here in California. Um, he's very rich. <laughs> uh, he, he's friend with Mark Zuckerberg and other people like that. Uh, these are very uh, smart people. Uh, you probably know him. Uh, this is Adam Rees, uh, also from the UK, very famous astronomer. This is Frank Drake from the Drake Equation that I was telling you earlier. Uh, so this is uh, the inauguration of the Breakthrough Listen Project, which was about a couple of years ago, or a year and a half or so. Uh, so this is a, the largest ever SETI project. Uh, and there is an easy way to explain this. So this is all the previous SETI projects. Uh, you might have here about the SETI Institute. That's not me, that's some more people. Uh, and of course, we have the Breakthrough Lisa. <laughs> Clear, right? <laughs> all right. So uh, the Breakthrough Lisa is a 10 year program, it's $100 million. And as I like to call it, it's the Apollo program of SETI. And 100 million sounds like a lot, but it's actually the same amount of money that uh, it was used to make this movie <laughs> that you may have seen at some point. Uh, all right, so what are we trying to do? Uh, so it's the largest project because we're trying to look for signals, artificial signals, from about a million stars everywhere around us. Uh, we're also looking at the center of our galaxy. And besides that, we're going to look about 100 galaxies all around us. Uh, by the time this project ends, uh, we're going to have petabytes of data, which I'll explain later how much that is, uh, which is a lot. Uh, and all is going to be publicly available. So you can go and look, take a look at our data and try to find your own signals uh, your own, uh, with your own analysis and, and, and whatnot. Uh, so by the end it's done, uh, it's going to be the largest public astronomy data set. Uh, so where are we collecting this data? Well, this is uh, one of the two main uh, radio telescopes we're using. Uh, so uh, it is called the Green Band Telescope. It's in Ware, Virginia. Uh, and it is the largest steerable object uh, in the world. So this, can, this dish right here, you can point it anywhere in the sky. And you can compare it to the trees around. So it's pretty big. And if it's not enough, uh, a friend of mine got this picture <laughs> from very close to it. And actually, uh, uh, on the ditch, you can fit two football fields. So it's super large. Yeah. Uh, there is an elevator here. I don't know if you can see, like, uh, I don't know how many floors this will be. But you basically take an elevator here, and then you walk around, and then you take another elevator here to the, to the top. It's pretty cool. You should go. <laughs> Uh, all right, so how much data are we collecting with this very large telescope? Uh, lots of it. Uh, we're collecting about one and a half uh, petabytes per day. Uh, to put it in uh, easier terms, that's about 34,000 Blu-ray copies of uh, Men in Black. <laughs> uh, this is the kind of data that we're collecting. 
uh, right here, you can see this is frequency. Um, so, you know, just like a radio station, like when you're in your car and you're looking for different channels, right, to, to, to hear, to uh, try to get to your favorite song, uh, we do the same, but we search about two billion different channels all at once. So that's a bit more than you can do with your ears. Uh, this is actually a real signal, uh, and we know that it's artificial. The reason why we know that it's artificial is because um, it is very narrowband, which means that uh, you know the frequency uh, is very narrow. The, the, the frequency that you find it, you know, just like a radio station, the same thing. Uh, we also know that this signal doesn't come from the solar system. Are you ready? <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> so we know also that this comes from a spacecraft. This is a Voyager <laughs> 1 spacecraft. Sorry to excite you for a little bit. Uh, this has been traveling for about 40 decade, uh, four decades. Um, uh, one of the fastest uh, spacecrafts that we have. And it was only recently that was able to get out of the solar system. So uh, stars are really far away, it's something to, to keep in mind. So, but yeah, so the reason why we look for these kinds of signals is because narrowband signals like this are impossible to be created in nature. Only artificial means can create this. So if we find a signal like this that comes from space, we know that it's not created by a black hole or you know, another star or something. It has to be aliens. So that would be cool, I think. <laughs> uh, just kind of to give you a, a little bit of what we're actually doing uh, now. So this is a paper that I'm publishing uh, now. And um, this is the first paper, uh, the first uh, science results. Uh, we started by looking at the first 700 stars. Uh, it actually takes a lot of time. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we didn't find any aliens, so that's the conclusion. But if you want another conclusion, uh, you can find your pick. You know, there is no such thing as bad publicity, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, there are many other things, I guess, that I could talk to you about today, but uh, if you have questions, you can go uh, talk to me. Uh, I guess one of the things that I would like to to say here is that, uh, so it's kind of repeat what I said before, all our data uh, is going to be public, uh, so you can go and, you know, use it. We have uh, tutorials on how to use data, so uh, we also have um, uh, an REU program, so for those that are in the audience that are uh, undergrads uh, and you are studying physics or engineering or something like that, uh, look at that and, you know, next summer uh, you can apply it and, and have a very wonderful experience. We just finished our REU program this summer. It was awesome. Uh, I had my own student. That was, uh, that was interesting. It was good. <laughs> uh, so we're also doing, like, a lot of instrumentation. Uh, GPUs, if that sounds familiar to anyone, uh, you can talk to me. Uh, we actually started a collaboration with Google uh, just now. Uh, and also we're doing some machine learning and other stuff. So many things going on. Uh, so if you want to follow what we're doing, uh, there is, uh, yeah, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook and so on. The websites are here. They're a bit dark, but uh, you can ask me and I'll tell you the website. Uh, so this is our team at the moment. Uh, if you see a pattern there, it's only guys. She's our secretary. So I will really ask the other half of the population to come help us search for aliens. We need you. Uh, also other guys, if you guys want to. But uh, uh, I think this is, uh, this is horrible. I think uh, we really need a better representation of women in our group. Uh, so yeah, come join us. I just want to finish by saying that uh, you know, uh, I think Apollo, the Apollo mission was a very um, great success. Uh, it changed the perspective of humanity on Earth. And maybe it's too much to compare ourselves with them, but I really think that the Break to Listen has a chance in the next 10 years to, to change our perspective of humanity in our galaxy. 
So stay tuned. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.